price elasticity of demand. Let's spend a few moments now talking about the price elasticity of supply. How do prices affect the behavior of the sellers, the producers? That is, as, as, as prices go up, yes, we expect they will be willing to produce more goods, but the question becomes, how much more? Here's a quick example. Okay. We've got a bicycle manufacturer who, when the price of bicycles is $100, produces 100 bicycles a week. That gives him a point on his supply curve, the quantity supplied at a given price. And then we ask, well, what would happen to, have to happen to that price in order for him to produce 200 bicycles a week? Well, he's going to want a higher price because he's going to have higher costs. Suppose we determine that in order to produce 200 bicycles a week, he wants to receive a minimum price of $300. So these two points together constitute another point on his supply curve. So he's got a supply curve looking like that. Now we've drawn it as a straight line because we use straight line supply and demand curves to explain the concepts. We know in the real world they're not really straight, but the concepts we're explaining still apply. So what's going on here? Well, it's a supply curve looking at two points. We know how to calculate, because we've done it with a demand curve, we know how to calculate the elasticity of supply between these two prices. Let's do that very quickly. The elasticity of supply is the change in the quantity supplied, percentage change, divided by the percentage change in the price. You remember how to do all that math? I'm going to do it fairly quickly. Percentage change in quantity is what? It's the change in quantity, 100, divided by the average quantity, 150. The percentage change in price is the change in price, $200, divided by the average price, $200, Hey, this is looking kind of neat, simple. When we do this, we get 100 over 150 is 2 thirds. 200 over 200 is 1. And so our coefficient here is 0.67. That's the price elasticity of supply between these two prices, between these two points on the supply curve. Now, quick and important question, is this a positive number or is this a negative number? Well, what happened? What happened to the quantity supply? It increased. So you had a positive change here at the same time it was caused by a positive change in price. And so the coefficient is always, always with a supply curve, a positive number. Remember demand? The coefficient was always a negative number. With supply, it's always a positive number. Now, a couple of other issues about this. Um, what do you suppose would happen to the supply curve? Let's, uh, let's give ourselves another example. Let's take a look at, say, the town you live in and the availability of two-bedroom apartments with 800, 900 square feet. Suppose we said that there were 10,000 apartments available and rents are $800 a month. I know that can fluctuate a lot either direction depending on where you live. Roll with me on this, okay? We see that there's 10,000 apartments supplied at a rent of $800 a month. That's a point on the supply curve. What do you suppose would happen to the quantity supplied of apartments if the available rent on those apartments jumped up to, oh, some higher number, $2,000 a month? What would happen? Well, the, your instinctive answer should be, well, they, there'd be more apartments available. And yeah, you're right, eventually. What's going to happen to the supply of those two-bedroom apartments over the next 24 hours? When, when landlords learn they can make $2,000 per apartment, are they going to go out and build a bunch of apartments in the next 24 hours? The answer is no. Not really feasible. The apartments they do have, they've got leased most of them, and you can't build an apartment in 24 hours. Not one I'd want to stay in anyway. So in the short run, what's going to happen? There's still going to be 10,000 apartments out there for $2,000 a piece. And so the, the supply curve is perfectly inelastic, perfectly vertical for the next 24 hours. What if you said, well, what's going to happen over the next 30 days or 60 days? Will the sellers have time to create more, to supply more apartments? 
Well, maybe in 30 days you can't build anymore, okay? Because it's going to take you a few months to get them built between permitting, etc. But I'll tell you something this. I'm a, I'm a landlord. If I had a one-bedroom apartment, you come into my apartment, there's a living room, there's a bedroom, there's a bathroom, there's a kitchen. And now I'm getting five, six hundred dollars a month for that. And you tell me I can get eighteen hundred dollars if I'll make it a two bedroom. Can I create a two bedroom apartment out of that? In a New York minute. What will I do? I'll knock down a few walls. I'll make the bathroom really small. I'll partition the place off into, we don't need a living room. Nobody needs a living room, right? We'll partition this off into, I don't know, at least two bedrooms. If the price is going to go up for two bedrooms and it also went up for eight bedrooms, you think I can get eight bedrooms out of this thing? Oh, hell yes. What's going to be your kitchen? Your kitchen is going to only be a little uh, hot burner, you know, a hot plate right there in the corner. You cook all your meals there. Uh, the rest of the house is divided up into very small bedrooms. So small that, in fact, you're going to have to sleep like a bat. You're going to have to hang your feet from the roof hanging straight down and sleep that way, okay? But, you know, for the right price, I can get creative. I can move my tenants out. It may take me 30, 60 days, but then I can create a nine-bedroom apartment. And maybe if a two-bedroom is going for 2000 maybe this thing will go for $6,000 instead of the 600 I was getting. Do you think I would do that? Oh, hell yes. As far as I still understand, more money is still better than less money. That's how sellers are going to respond. They're, they're going to be creative. They're not necessarily always going to ensure the best possible quality. But my point is, if you give it more time, the number of two-bedroom apartments available at $2,000 is going to grow to more than $10,000. It may grow to fifteen or $20,000. If it grows to $20,000 at $2,000 a piece, what's happened to your supply curve? Over time, it has become more elastic. And so that's one thing we want to remember. The supply of a product tends to be more elastic when you're looking at a longer time period over which to apply it. One last very quick rule of thumb. We're talking about straight line supply curves. Look at these three curves. S1, S2, S3. They all have pretty close to the same slope. But slope is not the same thing as elasticity. What we will say as a general rule for supply curves, straight line supply curves, is follow the supply curve back to its intercept. And if it intercepts the price axis up here, if your supply curve, straight line, comes back and intercepts the price axis, it's going to calculate out to be an elastic supply curve. If it intercepts the quantity axis down here, it's going to calculate out to be an inelastic supply curve. And if it happens to go through the origin, straight line, it's going to calculate out to be a unitary elastic supply curve. All right? If it helps you remember it, remember it this way. Inelastic supply curves are pretty vertical, right? That's why we write it inelastic. Tall, tall, straight, vertical line. Elastic supply curves are pretty flat. They look kind of like this. Elastic. Rules for morons. Works for me. So if it's got an intercept over here, it's elastic. If it's got an intercept down here, it's inelastic. And if it's split in the middle, unitary elastic. Quick rule of thumb, they say to you a question, you're too long to say. Okay? Bye.